Thank you so much, and uh, welcome to our panel on judicial independence in the 20th century. We are honored to be joined by Stephen Burbank, the David Berger Professor for the Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania, and author of landmark articles including Judicial Independence, Judicial Accountability, and Interbranch Relations. And Tara Lee Grove, Professor of Law at William & Mary, and author of equally important articles, including the origins and fragility of judicial independence. Uh, Stephen and Tara, we just heard this great discussion about how in the 19th century there were threats to increase and decrease the size of the court and to strip the court of jurisdiction. We begin the 20th century with threats to overturn judicial decisions by popular referenda and to recall judges for unpopular decisions and to overturn judicial decisions by votes of Congress. And then we have the great court packing plan in the middle of the 20th century, which is fought back. And by the end of the 20th century, we have landmark examples of the judiciary standing up to the executive in the federal and state systems, including Cooper and Aaron ordering the integration of public schools and U.S. v. Nixon, the unanimous decision ordering the president to turn over the tapes. I want to begin with Chief Justice Taft. Uh, I have had the pleasure of writing this book about him for the American President series and was impressed by uh, the fact that he was a presidential chief justice and judicial president. He approached every decision as president in constitutional terms, asking, did the Constitution allow the action, unlike Theodore Roosevelt, who asked, did the Constitution prohibit it? He yearned to be chief justice and fought the election of 1912 on the question of judicial independence, believing that Roosevelt and Wilson, by endorsing populist attacks on judges, were the equivalents of demagogues. And we have in the reading this dramatic quotation from Chief Justice Taft, the agitation with reference to the courts, the general attacks upon them, the grotesque remedies proposed of recall of judges and recall of judicial decisions, and the resort of demagogues to the unpopularity of the courts as a means of promoting their own political fortunes all must be lamented. Uh, Taft becomes Chief Justice and he has three great achievements. The Judiciary Act of 1922 creating the Conference of Federal of Circuit Judges, the Judiciary Act of 25 giving the Supreme Court uh, uh, control over its own certiorari jurisdiction, and building the magnificent Supreme Court building symbolizing the Supreme Court as a fully equal branch. Um, Stephen, uh, Doug, Judge Doug Ginsburg was here to talk about the Taft book, and he called Taft the second most important chief after Marshall because of his role in shoring up the independence of the federal judiciary with the judiciary acts that I just mentioned. Is that a fair assessment? And please evaluate, if you will, Chief Justice Taft's role in protecting judicial independence. I think it is a, a fair characterization. Um, for most of our history, uh, federal judges conducted their judicial business in solitary splendor. Um, the concept of the federal judiciary was more notional than it was an organizational uh, reality, and it's not surprising, therefore, that uh, the concept of judicial independence was associated primarily with individual judges rather than with uh, the separate third branch of the judiciary. Uh, Taft's reforms uh, changed all that. Uh, they enabled uh, the federal judiciary actually to function uh, as a third branch um, through um, greater efficiency in management of the affairs of the courts. Uh, the effect that that had on judges in uh, federal judges who had, might have thought of themselves as conducting separate duchies, uh, and that they all had something uh, in common to pull for, and Taft uh, was a remarkable person in terms of his political skills. Uh, he had vast networks. Uh, he kept in touch with people. He made most federal judges understand uh, that um, they would better hang together uh, rather than uh, separately. And so by creating the, what we now call the Judicial Conference of, of the United States, uh, putting in place, although it didn't happen until he had died, uh, the, uh, the mechanism that gave the Supreme Court of the United States the power to promulgate rules of procedure through the Rules Enabling Act of 1934. Taft was really responsible for that. Indeed, early on in my career, I found in a 
uh, dusty archive in Des Moines, Iowa, the, the eureka moment of any young scholar, namely a letter from, from Taft to Senator Albert Cummins of Iowa, which is why I was in Des Moines, uh, in which Taft had included a draft of the second section of the Enabling Act of 1934, as wow. it was in fact enacted. So he was very actively involved in politics, but he was also, again, a good politician. So rather than himself go to testify in favor of what is, was called the Judge's Bill, the act in 1925 that uh, converted most of the Supreme Court's docket into a discretionary docket, um, he sent over uh, some of his colleagues uh, who were very effective uh, uh, in testifying in favor, and including George Sutherland, who of course had been a senator and was testifying in, in front of some of his former colleagues. Uh, ultimately, in 1939, again after Taft had died, but I think we can give him a good deal of responsibility for it, you had uh, the creation of the Administrative Office of the United States, and more important, a transfer of the budgetary uh, power from the, from the Attorney General of the United States uh, to the judiciary. So if you put all that, all that together, uh, I think it's a fair characterization of Taft as being next to, to Marshall, and in some ways even more than Marshall, uh, in terms of the judicial, judiciary as a branch of government, um, an independent branch of government, he deserves an enormous amount of credit. That is wonderful for those of us who are Taft admirers to hear your high estimation. And what an amazing eureka moment. You know, it was in, while he was president, Taft made basically a State of the Union speech saying the reform of civil and criminal procedure is the most urgent question facing America at this moment. Can you imagine a president saying that in prime time today? And it was that that led him to propose in 1923 the act that became. Well, may I please. Uh, add to that? Um, it is interesting. Um, uh, and I think not just with the benefit of hindsight, that Taft represented uh, a lot of reforms that had deep substantive and political resonance as involving efficiency. Uh, th thus, in the, in, the, in the period that you were referring to earlier, uh, his, uh, he, he, he characterized so much of what he wanted to do in terms of efficiency, even though he well knew it had to do with power. Tara, your estimation on Taft, you know, you, 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 I, I'm very eager to hear it. You have written that judicial independence is as much a convention or a norm as uh, anything compelled by law. And yet when we think of Taft's reform, his great achievement was a, as an administrator. Uh, Henry Stimson, who served as Secretary of War under Roosevelt, Truman, Taft, and Hoover, said that Taft was the greatest administrator of them all. And as described by Stephen, his reforms were primarily administrative. Was that the key to his uh, contributions to judicial independence, or was it his personal leadership, or do you have a different estimation of his role in promoting judicial independence? Um, so there, there are many fun things to, to say about William Howard Taft. Um, you, you alluded to one of them. He said he, he was president of the United States, but his dream job was to be Chief Justice of the United States. And I don't think many people can say that. Um, one of my other thing, favorite, favorite notes about Taft in 1912, when he lost the election to, to Woodrow Wilson, he actually called it a win because he had defeated Teddy Roosevelt's attacked, attacks on, on the federal judiciary. He wrote to a friend after the election, yes, we pulled this one out. It's good, um, which you don't hear from many, many presidents who are now, how, now lame duck. So I think he really believed in judicial independence. That was, however, not a focus of, of his, his chief justiceship, probably in part because um, although there were attacks on the federal judiciary during that period, um, that was not the, those were not the key moments of the attacks. I think he was trying to build the federal judiciary for the long term. Um, and I think you've alluded to some of his comments Steve has alluded to some, some of his contributions, and Steve has alluded to some others. Um, but I want to talk about another thing that Taft did, and that was to change the notion of the Supreme Court's role within the federal judiciary. Um, and this was part of his efforts to build the federal judiciary as an institution. Um, so he did many things on the administrative, administrative side. But in advocating the Judges Bill, the Judiciary Act of 1925, Taft had a vision of the US Supreme Court Prior to that time, a big part of the Supreme Court's job was to correct errors in the lower courts, to make sure they were doing the right thing. Um, and he thought that was not at all what the US Supreme Court should be doing. 
Uh, it, that was in part because of capacity constraints. Um, the Supreme Court's caseload had gone up to about 18, 1900 by the late 19th century, and they were able to bang out maybe four to 500 cases out of the couple thousand that were on their docket in the early 20th century. Now, note, four to 500 cases per year. A little bit different from the 80 they, they sometimes put together uh, in, in today's world, but. With fewer law clerks. <laughs> With fewer law clerks. They, they decided 400 to 500 cases per year. But Taft said, look, look, we're deciding a whole bunch of cases that we shouldn't be deciding. The Supreme Court should no longer be a court of error. It should be a court that, that sets general principles of law for lower courts to use in, in many cases. Um, I, I know many people in the room are, are, are judges who try to make sense of Supreme Court decisions, so, so one can question how, how good of a job they do in clarifying the law, but that was the vision that Taft had of the U.S. Supreme Court, and you see this throughout the 1920s and in his testimony, um, both leading up to and on behalf of the judges' bill, um, saying we, we, we need certiorari jurisdiction so that we can choose those cases where we can define those general principles of law. The idea being that just like, um, just like we have hierarchical systems in many other areas, we should have a hierarchical judiciary with the Supreme Court setting the basic boundaries and then the lower courts applying those principles in specific cases. And I think that was a major contribution to the judiciary, even if it wasn't focused on judicial independence. One of Taft's other great goals, in addition to his administrative achievements, was massing the court, persuading the justices to speak in one voice, and converging around unanimous opinions, often written by the chief. And in this sense, he was inspired by his hero, the great chief, John Marshall. He was remarkably successful in this goal at the beginning of his chief justiceship, persuading even former opponents like Brandeis and Holmes to join him in unanimous opinions, because he said, I don't generally approve of dissents. But by the second half of his chief justiceship, the court began to splinter, Partly, ironically, because of the uh, Judiciary Act of 25, which by allowing the court to focus on controversial constitutional cases and avoiding the technical ones, created more division. And that division increased on the way up to the New Deal, culminating in the series of five to four decisions that led to the court packing plan. So Stephen, what can you tell us about the chief's role and, and uh, judge's role on appellate courts in general of promoting judicial independence and institutional legitimacy by creating unanimity and collegiality, and what was Taft's contribution to that? Uh, well, there, it, it's often important that there be an adult in the room, um, and the Chief Justice can be that adult in the room. Um, we see it in Taft, I think we see it in, in our current Chief Justice. Um, when your colleagues are, are so uh, bound up in, in, um, in their particular views, sometimes it requires that the Chief Justice remind them that uh, they are part of a larger uh, enterprise and that um, the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, um, what political scientists call diffuse support for the Supreme Court is absolutely essential uh, to its continuing uh, function as an independent branch of the government, uh, free of undue influence by the executive or the legislature. If the, if the Supreme Court of the United States and the federal judiciary as a whole loses what the late great Richard Arnold called the consent of the governed, um, then they will lose their independence. Um, we haven't talked about judicial accountability, but only a lawyer can think about judicial independence uh, and not think about uh, judicial accountability. There are different sides of the same coin. No society would want judges or courts. And let's remember that Article Three of the Constitution invests not judges, but courts with uh, judicial power. Uh, no society would want completely independent courts that were free to decide cases any way that that they wanted. The society wouldn't be able to, to operate. So you have to have a certain amount of accountability. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of political influence on the courts. Um, the tools uh, that preserve in the Constitution judicial independence, um, life tenure and uh, a um, secure compensation are in fact not adequate at all to protect judicial independence. There's so many 
ways, formal and informal, in which the political branches can influence uh, the federal courts that without norms, um, or as Tara has called them, conventions, um, we, be, we would be in deep trouble, the judiciary would be in deep trouble. So to get back to your question, Jeff, the Chief Justice of the United States, and it continues to astonish me that even very bright people sometimes refer to him as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice of the United States has a unique role to play, and um, I, I'm, I'm happy that Taft was in that role because he uh, was very good at it. Uh, Tara, tell us about court packing and the role of Chief Justice Hughes and the conventions, as you put it, that emerged from it. There was the most dramatic example of the 20th century of an effort to influence the court by changing its numbers. It was rejected. And ever since then, as you note, uh, at least throughout the rest of the 20th century, the notion of court packing was unthinkable, although it is now back on the table. So tell us what yes. it was about the defeat of the court packing plan that yeah. contributed to judicial independence throughout the 20th century. Um, I published a paper in March of 2018 saying that court packing was the, the single most off the table court curbing measure, which I believe was true in March 2018. Um, and and that, that seems to be changing. And that really, really brings us back to, um, to this earlier period and what actually happened in 1937. Uh, so a couple of things about that. Roosevelt announced in 1935, right after the decision in Schechter Poultry and a few other decisions, um, that he wasn't going to stand for the US Supreme Court, um, striking down all the New Deal legislation. And he, and he tells the press, my Department of Justice is working on this. We're not going to stay in this horse and buggy era of constitutional law. He doesn't say very much at all publicly, um, says nothing at all, virtually nothing at all about the US Supreme Court in 1936, thinking that might hurt his election chances. But it turns out that US Department of Justice was working very hard behind the scenes to try to figure out what to do about the US Supreme Court. And they looked at a lot of options. They thought about stripping Supreme Court jurisdiction. They thought about imposing supermajority requirements on the US Supreme Court, which is another proposal that other people had made in the early 20th century. Uh, I thought about a variety of things, but finally decided that the single best way to change the US Supreme Court was packing the Supreme Court. Um, and in a very long memo, um, one, one high level Justice Department person said, um, we need to change their decisions. Now, when, when FDR finally, um, finally proposed this in February of 1937, that's not the rationale he gave for court packing. As I suspect many people in this room have heard, uh, Roosevelt said, well, you know, um, we, we need some new blood in the judiciary. We, we, these, ju these justices need a little bit of extra help. Um, they're obviously not able to decide all their cases even after the, the grant of certiorari jurisdiction. Um, and you know, the younger guys might be able to just do a little more work, a little faster. Um, and he says a few other things, but People kind of get the subtext, but he's not talking about the subtext. And so Chief Justice Hughes comes back and said, actually, we're fine. We can do our jobs. We were plenty, we're, we're, we're pl absolutely well staffed. Um, and also points out, and this is something that had been debated in the 19th century as well, if we have more people, it's going to take a lot longer to make decisions. Because it's hard enough to get nine people to stop talking um, and actually to come to a ruling. Imagine if it were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15. Um, and those of you who have been in Ong Bank courts and the courts of appeals, I'm sure know exactly this, um, this, this uh, problem. So Chief Justice Hughes refuses to comment on the merits of the court packing plan, but at least undercuts this rationale, I think, in a very powerful way. Uh, so Roosevelt comes back and says, OK, um, here's the real reason. The real reason is we have a Congress and a president who are working hard to change the constitutional vision of this country. We are looking for a constitutional vision that will help the working man. And there is one branch of government that is completely cutting against this crucial constitutional vision that will uphold 
uphold minimum wage laws, uphold maximum hour laws. And that's the US Supreme Court. And American public, that needs to change. Now, I think a lot of times when we hear about the court packing plan in US history, we hear Roosevelt proposed this plan. People thought it was crazy and absolutely raced against it. Um, and then it was, it was smashed in defeat, ruined Roosevelt's presidency, and, and he regretted it forever. I think sometimes that's, that's, that's the story people are told, and that's just flatly not true. In fact, Roosevelt's plan came very close to passage. Um, even if he might not have gotten a sixth justice court packing bill as he initially proposed, there's a very good chance he would have gotten a four justice court packing plan had it not been for the death of, of the chief proponent, um, Senator Joe Robinson. And of course, as we all know, possibly also had it not been for the Supreme Court's change in direction. Um, the swi so-called switch in time that changed nine. Now, one of those decisions, West, Host West Coast Hotel versus Parrish, um, there are a lot of debates about that decision because the vote in the U.S. Supreme Court had occurred well before, uh, the internal vote in the U.S. Supreme Court had occurred well before Roosevelt announced his plan. Um, but that wasn't the only case where the Supreme Court kind of switched on social and economic legislation. Um, in other cases, like Jones and Laughlin, um, the Supreme Court also ruled in favor of either federal or state power to regulate economic conditions. And that also significantly impact this, impacted the success of the court packing plan. But I have argued there was not a strong norm against court packing even in 1937, even after the failure of Roosevelt's plan. And we see some evidence of that in the early 1950s when members of Congress propose a constitutional amendment to fix the size of the US Supreme Court at nine. That constitutional amendment also would have made it impossible to strip Supreme Court, the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction over constitutional claims. In discussing that constitutional amendment, people didn't say Roosevelt had violated a norm. They said, this is something that almost passed um, about 15 years ago. We need to protect the US Supreme Court from future packing attempts by passing this constitutional amendment. Now, that amendment passed the U.S. Senate um, by a pretty wide margin six days before the U.S. Supreme Court decided Brown versus the Board of Education. After that, there was far less support for the amendment. And now, some pro progressives opposed it because they thought that this is just a, it's a bad idea to fix the U.S. Supreme Court. Maybe we'll, we'll need more justices later on. Um, but after Brown versus the Board of Education, I think a lot of, a lot of support was lost among the more conservative members of Congress as well. And, Go ahead. and so the final thing I'll say is, I believe that the norm, current norm as of March of 2018 against court packing came largely from political rhetoric. Because when there were court curbing proposals thereafter, people would denounce it. People on both sides of the political aisle, Republicans and Democrats, would denounce whatever, um, whether it was a jurisdiction stripping measure, something else, a particular nominee they did not like, they would denounce it as, this is just another court packing attempt. So such that court packing became a political epithet as of March 2018. Let me thank you, first of all, for that extraordinarily illuminating account of court packing and reminding us of the contingency of its failure, just as in the 19th century, uh, the size of the court fluctuated. You remind us that it almost succeeded, and it was rhetoric and the bipartisan opposition both in Congress, where congressional Democrats like uh, the, vice, the vice president uh, denounced it, as well as on the court, where it was Louis Brandeis, who was the conduit between Chief Justice Hughes and Congress, helped to defeat it. Stephen, you, with your important work, basically your reflections on what it was that killed court packing in the 30s and what the lessons are for it, whether it might succeed today. Well, I mean, Tara's account is, I think, absolutely right. I would add two different um, possible contributing factors. One, um, there were people, including progressives, who were concerned about the aggregation of power in the executive uh, and, and thought that the court packing plan, if it were approved, would represent another step towards perhaps a too powerful executive. The other, which will be near and dear to many people in this room, is that um, before the court packing plan came up for a vote, 
Congress uh, passed legislation that made it possible for the first time for justices of the Supreme Court to assume senior status. Uh, that had not previously been, uh, been permitted um, because of concern that you could have 20 people on the Supreme Court. There was an obvious answer to that, the answer that was adopted in 1937, and that is that when a justice assumes senior status, uh, he or she may retain the office but cannot continue to do judicial work on the Supreme Court. Um, some people thought that that legislation uh, was proposed as part of the campaign against uh, uh, Roosevelt's plan. That's not accurate because the legislation, in fact, had been proposed before, uh, the year before, before uh, Roosevelt's plan was known. Uh, it was proposed because Congress was chagrined that although in 1869, when, uh, when Congress first provided uh, the opportunity for federal judges to have a pension. Um, the concern had been expressed, well, if they, if they get off the courts, uh, give up their Article III uh, positions, then their pensions could be cut. That was treated derisively, oh, we'd never do that. Well, in fact, they did do it. In the Economy Act of 1932, which cut Oliver Wendell Holmes' pension by half, and Congress felt very ashamed of themselves for that, and uh, the, the remedy was to permit an alternative to resigning your Article III post, namely, you keep your Article III post, you can't continue to, to participate in the work of the Supreme Court, but you can do what justices have done since uh, then, which is to sit, some of them, uh, with lower courts. Um, and uh, although it was correctly um, responded to the, to the claim that this was done to defeat court packing, no, it wasn't, but Hamilton Fish, who was perhaps Roosevelt's chief antagonist in the House of Representatives was openly gleeful that the passage of this legislation would doom uh, the court backing plan. And indeed, shortly after the legislation was passed, uh, one or more members of the Supreme Court uh, retired from the Supreme Court, but they retired in senior status and they got, therefore their pensions were protected. Thanks for those two very important uh, insights about the uh, internal incentives for judges to retire and the external desire not to consolidate too much power in the executive. Tara, I, I want to answer this basic uh, broad question. Why was it that for the rest of the 20th century, in the midst of some of the most controversial challenges to the executive and Congress in our history, from Brown versus Board of Education to Cooper and Aaron to Watergate to uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, the norms of judicial independence and against court packing essentially continued. And you note that norms in the nominations process, like the filibuster requirement, were only repealed at the beginning of the 21st century. Things started to get more polarized beginning with Robert Bork, but even for most of the 80s and 90s, we had lopsided confirmation for justices. And it seems to be in the 21st century, as the next panel will observe, that those norms are breaking. So which... Why did the norms persist, and what began to challenge them to fray? So it's it's a, one of the things that that led me to look into the history of judicial independence um, was academic scholarship, actually. Um, and I and I and I'll say I started the research on that in in fall of 2015, um, at a time when no one thought judicial independence was in trouble. So I wasn't trying to you know, foreshadow something. I was, I was actually looking historically. Um, why is it that people talk about jurisdiction stripping so much? Um, and, and academics talk about it. These, these proposals are actually made in Congress. And nobody ever talks about what happened in 1802, firing Article III judges by abolishing their courts. Um, hardly anyone talks about until very recently, defying federal court orders or court packing. So my goal was to try to figure this out. Um, and I think there are multiple reasons, but I think one of it is the way that we talk about our federal judiciary. Um, the way we, meaning in part academics, have talked about our federal judiciary. Starting around the um, 1960s and 1970s, academics offered a really powerful story to support stripping federal jurisdiction. They said, look, this is a way to legitimate federal judicial decisions. 
if we know, this, this gets back to Steve's point about the sort of um, political accountability is important to judicial, to judicial independence. If we, if we know that Congress can strip federal jurisdiction whenever it wants to, then that really supports the idea that when federal judges have jurisdiction to make decisions, this is basically a license from Congress for them to decide as they think makes sense. What was interesting is this story, which you know has some um, makes some intuitive sense, could also be told about court packing. If you know that the president and Congress could come and pack the Supreme Court whenever they want to, that would legitimate arguably judicial decisions because when they don't do it, that's kind of a license from President and Congress to, to stay, keep doing what you're doing and, and we're fine with it. But academics didn't tell that story about court packing throughout the mid to late 20th century, even as they did tell that story about jurisdiction stripping. I think it's a hard question as to why not. I think that many, many people in both legal academia um, and in Congress were really bothered by the mess of 1937. And I think that's why court packing became the political epithet. We'll do lots of stuff to the federal judiciary. We'll propose jurisdiction stripping measures, but we're not gonna do that thing that Roosevelt did later on. And then once something picks up in terms of political re rhetoric and becomes a political epithet, it takes on a life of its own. Um, so all the way up, up through the proceedings over Merrick Garland, People used court packing as a political epithet. Republicans justified not holding hearings on Merrick Garland on the ground that the Democrats, in their view, had packed the DC circuit in 2013 by abolishing the filibuster for lower federal court judges and putting three judges on the DC circuit court of appeals and then putting lots of other people on, on the federal courts. Republicans said, well, you tried to pack the court and that therefore justifies what we're doing now. What's interesting to me now is that the rhetoric is changing on court packing among academics. So far, members of Congress are saying, well, you know, we'll, we're looking into it, but they haven't, they haven't embraced it. It's coming from constitutional law scholars. And this is actually something I'm writing about right now. Um, and that, to me, should scare people who care about judicial independence. Because when you look at the, uh, look in the mid to late 20th century, one thing that was making, help, helping to make court packing a political epithet and something that was off the table is that scholars didn't talk about it as something that was on the table. I found one proposal in 1973 after Roe versus Wade where a conservative scholar suggested court packing. I suspect no one in this room has ever heard of that because it was completely off the table at that time. And now scholars are changing their rhetoric. But the other thing that I think is very interesting about the current period is that unlike Roosevelt's plan in 1937, the current rhetoric is not about a specific judicial decision or even a particular trend in judicial decisions. Roosevelt was angry about what the Supreme Court was doing. People today are angry about what senators did what presidents have done. This is coming entirely externally from the judiciary. Progressives are angry that Merrick Garland um, was left completely, left complete without a, at, a, at a hearing. They talk about Justice Gorsuch as filling a stolen seat. Um, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings were something, um, and I'll just leave it there, um, but certainly did not look good for the federal judiciary. That's what's driving these allegations, something entirely external to the federal judiciary. Um, and that means, in my view, that federal judges cannot be the sole source of judicial independence. People also have to think about protecting in judicial independence and the appearance of judicial independence in the way that we select our judges in the presidency and the Senate. Thank you very much for that. Steve, the same extremely important question to you, and I'm so eager for your answer. Why did norms of judicial independence persist for most of the 20th century? Why did they begin to fray at the beginning of the 
21st, and what do you make of the new rhetoric among academics and others endorsing court packing that would have been unthinkable for most of the 20th century? Well, I'm going to try to stay in the 20th century. Good. Well, that's our panel, so that we, yeah. can, um, we can do and, that. And um, I support scholarship just as it supports me, but I don't have much illusion that um, most federal judges pay much attention to what scholars have to say. I don't think the views of scholars are particularly important uh, here. Um, I think that uh, the views of the public are, however, and it is worth noting that modern polling really only dates to the, to the 1930s. Um, and um, polls have consistently shown uh, that the, the courts in general and the Supreme Court in particular uh, have much greater support among the public than, do, uh, than does the Congress. Uh, the executive, it, it fluctuates uh, a, a little bit more. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, I think uh, that uh, Keith Whittington is right that the, that, that the uh, one of the, and I'm quoting him, one of the notable developments of the 20th century in the American judicial system is the rise of a bipartisan commitment to judicial independence and robust constitutional, constitutional checks on the power of elected officials. Um, a key moment that uh, has hardly been referred to uh, in these uh, uh, discussions so far is Watergate. Um, and uh, for people of my generation, I'm 71, uh, Watergate is you know, a very, very important moment. For me, it was particularly important, and forgive me a, a personal story, I had the privilege of clerking for Chief Justice Warren Burger, And on my first day at work, uh, I spent the morning going around filling out forms, and then I had lunch. And then I went back to my office, and a, a messenger arrived with an envelope and said, this is from the Chief Justice. He would like you to proofread this opinion. It was the Nixon tapes case. Wow. So the, the notion that no person is above the law for somebody who lived through... So, sorry, were there any typos? <laughs> That's confidential. Okay. We'll subpoena uh, the answer. The, the no, notion that no person is above the law was very powerfully enforced on people of my generation, perhaps a little bit more powerfully on me. Uh, and that uh, principle was, of course, again vindicated in Clinton against Jones. Um, and... So I think Watergate and uh, the uh, unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court in the Nixon tapes case uh, did much to cement uh, bipartisan support for the Supreme Court because it showed us that at times of, uh, of real peril for our democracy, uh, the one institution that perhaps we can rely on uh, is the federal courts. Uh, wow. Well, we're going to have just lightning rounds of closing statements, um, and I'm just going to ask each of you if you had to identify, based on the lessons of the 20th century, a single thing that the federal judiciary, the federal judicial center, or the National Constitution Center could do to promote judicial independence in the face of threats today, what would it be? Uh, and and uh, Steve, uh, first to you. It would be to constantly reinforce the notion that judicial independence and judicial accountability are joined at the hip, that it makes no sense to talk about judicial independence without talking about judicial accountability, that if the federal judiciary shows itself to be properly accountable, it will preserve its judicial independence. Thank you for that. Tara, last word for you. A single uh, thing that the Constitution Center, the Federal Judicial Center, or the Federal Judiciary could do to promote judicial independence. I think it's important, important for people to see the examples that push against their presuppositions. I think far too often the media is talking about five to four decisions on a certain subject, subset of subjects, um, abortion, affirmative action, and so on, um, where, people, where judge, judges make predictable responses. And what people don't hear about is the number of 
federal appeals court decisions that are unanimous, which is the vast, vast majority of them, the number of Supreme Court decisions that are unanimous. And how can that be if people are just politicized? And I think making that the, a larger picture of how we visualize the judiciary would be extremely important to preserve that diffuse support that the courts so desperately need. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15-minute break, but for all they have done to shed light on the question of judicial independence, please thank our panelists. Superb and riveting.